yeah, required reminder, uh, everyone please take a moment to silence your cell phones or any other electronic devices. We can uh, devote ourselves uh, to the proceedings here today. Council has uh, some great uh, events uh, coming up in the not too distant future that I'd like to share. Uh, following on the heels of the deadline for the fiscal cliff, uh, Moody's analytics chief economist Mark Zandi will join us on January the 18th. Well, be able to update us at that point, obviously, on the outcome uh, of this uh, high drama, uh, as well as give an economic forecast going forward for 2013. Uh, on February 7th, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Thomas Friedman will uh, address the challenges America faces in the future as a world power. Uh, and on March the 8th, former Irish, prime, uh, Irish President Mary Robinson will visit the council and offer her views uh, on her vision for the future of the global system. Additional details on these programs and other events uh, are in your program today and in literature at the registration table. We also have a number of travel opportunities uh, that are coming up uh, that may be of interest, including a 10-day Mediterranean cruise of ancient cities from Malaga, Spain to Palermo, Italy with, Ronald, with Ambassador Ronald Newman and a small group tour of Morocco from the Imperial Cities to the Sahara. Uh, please be sure to pick up more information about these and other exciting council tours on your way out. All of these events uh, hosted by the council enable uh, us to do our most important programs to a diverse group of over 2,100 middle and high school students uh, in uh, 63 schools throughout the Philadelphia area None of these programs would be possible without our members and our partners, uh, such as Boeing, uh, our corporate sponsor for this afternoon, uh, and a generous supporter of our education programs as well. We're particularly grateful today uh, to the Sabina and Rosie Bakari Foundation for its ongoing support uh, and sponsorship of this series uh, on South Asia, and for this program in particular today. Uh, both Dr. Raza Bukhari and his wife, Dr. Sabina Bukhari, have been longtime supporters and friends of, pro, uh, of the Council's programs, and their foundation has sponsored uh, many events such as today's that help us foster an understanding of what is perhaps the hottest of the world's hotspots in South Asia. Uh, Raza Bukhari uh, is the recipient of the Philadelphia Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award, a physician turned entrepreneur, managing partner of RBX Capital, and a vice chairman of the Royal Affairs Council. He was, unfortunately uh, for us, unexpectedly called away for a business meeting and so unable to join us today. But on Raz's behalf, it's my great uh, pleasure now to introduce our guest of honor, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Ambassador Crocker has had a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service, serving the United States in the world for nearly four decades. This past July, he retired from his position as ambassador to Afghanistan, a post he held since July of 2011. Previously, he held five ambassadorships between 1990 and 2009, and as you'll hear, they were all easy, cushy posts, uh, including appointments in Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. Uh, over the years, uh, he's served our country in many positions and during many events of great historical significance. A few to note, the reopening of the American Embassy in Kabul in 2002, and serving at the American Embassy in Beirut during both the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 and the bombings of our embassy and marine barracks in 1983. For his service, Ambassador Crocker has received a number of distinguished awards throughout his career. To name a few, in 2009 he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, of course, in our nation's highest civilian honor. President George W. Bush conferred on him the personal rank of Career Ambassador in 2004, the highest in the Foreign Service, and in May of 2009, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced the establishment of the Ryan C. Crocker Award for Outstanding Achievement in Expeditionary Diplomacy. 
When not ministering to diplomatic affairs, Ambassador Crocker has also had a prestigious career in academia, serving as Dean, Executive Professor, and Edward and Howard Cruz Endowed Chair at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M, and as International Affairs Advisor at the National War College. He is currently teaching at Yale University, where he was recently named the first Kissinger Senior Fellow at the Johnson Center for the Study of American Diplomacy. In Ambassador Cracker, our country is fortunate, indeed, to have a dedicated, insightful representative who has served in what is widely viewed as the most consequential region of our times. Please join me now in welcoming Ambassador Ryan Cracker. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for that uh, generous introduction, and congratulations to you as you uh, assume the helm of uh, this great World Affairs Council. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here at this, uh, this moment of transition as uh, uh, Claudia hands over to Craig. Uh, uh, Claudia is legendary within and outside the uh, Council system. Um, uh, and I know she leaves it in good hands. Uh, uh, kind of a short tenure, Claudia, a mere quarter of a century. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I met uh, Joan Russell uh, earlier. Um, uh, Craig talked about the uh, council trips. Well, I've just come back from one uh, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, that the uh, Philadelphia Council organized, and I have never done uh, a tour before. Um, probably will never do one again unless it's with the Philadelphia Council because you are the gold standard. So, uh, 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 sorry to be a little late getting here, uh, like about six weeks late, uh, uh, because of um, uh, Hurricane Sandy, but I, I very much wanted to, to, to take this opportunity. I am a huge fan of uh, the World Affairs Councils, uh, 95 of them nationwide. Uh, this is one of the biggest and certainly the best. Uh, uh, those of you who heard my radio interview, um, I put in a you know, paid political announcement, uh, an unpaid political announcement, uh, just just saying what an important role this council and others uh, play in uh, ensuring that the American public has an understanding of what goes on in the world beyond our shores and why it is important. Uh, so uh, thanks to all of you, uh, thanks in particular to your sponsors uh, led by Boeing uh, uh, for um, Making you the premier organization that you that you are. Um, uh, I know we've got a number of members of the armed services uh, uh, here today, both um, past and present. Um, delighted to see them. Uh, I know you're trying to eat lunch, but if I could just ask uh, all of those who wear or who have worn our nation's uniform, if you could stand. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I know it's taken some of you to some very hard places. Um, um, now, I'm a member, or was a member for almost 40 years of, of another service, the Foreign Service. Um, uh, we work very, very closely with the military in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, as we did in Lebanon during the Marine deployment. Uh, uh, we, um, we take the same oath that you do. We raise our right hands and swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, that doesn't mean just in the cafes of Brussels or the restaurants of Paris. Uh, uh, 
it means in the hard places where our brothers and sisters in uniform are also called to go, be it Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya. Uh, and we take our losses. Uh, most recently, uh, Chris Stevens and his colleague in, in Benghazi. Um, as Craig pointed out, I have been an ambassador uh, six times to uh, six countries that most sane people would not spend a weekend in. Uh, uh, in those six countries, uh, in three of those six countries, uh, one of my predecessors as ambassador was assassinated. Uh, and the, uh, the hard truth is we have lost more ambassadors in the line of duty since the end of World War II than the, all branches of the military have lost general officers. Uh, it is inherently a dangerous profession. Um, uh, we are the most expeditionary of all the nation services. At least 75% of us are deployed overseas at any given moment. Um, uh, our largest embassies are not London and Paris, they're Kabul and Baghdad. Uh, uh, there's been a great debate uh, after the assassination of my friend Chris Stevens, uh, someone I knew for 20 years, we're a pretty small tribe in the uh, Near Eastern Division. Uh, my hope is that that debate does not lead to a retrenchment of diplomatic engagement. Uh, because in this tumultuous world that I'll uh, briefly describe, uh, particularly in the Middle East, we need more, not less engagement. Uh, uh, if we are to avoid situations uh, that can truly threaten our national security uh, and require even greater expenditure of resources. Uh, uh, and again, for those of you who have um, children in college, um, I hope they would think about taking a foreign service exam. It's given, I think, three times a year. It's free. You may get them out of your basement after <laughs> after they graduate, um, and uh, as the Marines say, uh, we don't promise you a rose garden, but you will never have a boring day. Um, what I thought I'd do is uh, just briefly uh, sketch out some broad themes on um, the greater Middle East, an area I define as extending from Morocco on the Atlantic coast through North Africa. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Levant, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Palestinian territories, Iraq, Iran, but also Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, uh, it's a little bit of an arbitrary um, uh, definition uh, that I use mainly because I served in most of those places. Um, uh, but in spite of the differences in ethnicities, in language, in culture, uh, they also share uh, some commonalities. Uh, uh, one of them is, with the exception, of course, of Israel, they are predominantly Muslim countries. Um, uh, the other is something rather different that we don't think about, but they do. Um, Every one of those countries uh, over the last several hundred years has been occupied by at least one Western power. Every single one. Uh, uh, in the modern era, it started with Egypt in 1798 when Napoleon uh, invaded and occupied that country. Uh, most of us don't know that Napoleon was ever in Egypt. He just needed to kill a little time between major European engagements um, and decide to spend it there. Uh, uh, the French, the British, the Italians, the Russians uh, all took their turn uh, as imperial states, um, colonial occupiers. Um, that profoundly affects the view from the region. Um, uh, it means they learned a long time ago, for example, that when the foreigners come with their well-trained, well-equipped armies, uh, 
better just fade into the woodwork because you can't beat them force on force. Um, preserve your lives, uh, preserve your energies, uh, uh, wait for them to think it's all done, uh, and then, then start sniping. Uh, uh, what that means, whether it's Morocco under the French, uh, or Afghanistan or Iraq with us, um, the real war doesn't start until long after we think we've already won it. Um, uh, they are very, very good at the counterpunch. Um, uh, another characteristic uh, 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 is against that sense of occupation, um, and that affects us. We, we consider ourselves the ultimate anti-imperialist power given our own history and our revolution. That is not, broadly speaking, how we are seen in Middle Eastern eyes. Uh, we are seen as the successors of the European colonialists uh, and have to work, act, have to be aware of that and work actively to counteract it. Um, uh, we did that in several forms. I negotiated agreements both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, affirming the sovereignty of both states, giving them uh, actual, real control over their own affairs, uh, and in so doing, took that card away from our adversaries who, who accused us of being occupiers. Um, in my 40 years of diplomacy, I learned a couple of lessons, um, and I'm going to tell you what they are, but don't worry, there are only two of them. I'm a slow learner, so a couple of decades, one lesson. Uh, uh, the first I've already prefaced. Um, uh, it's a complicated region with its own way of looking at the West and at us. Um, uh, that means, in simple terms, be careful what you get into. Um, uh, you need to understand the region, a particular country, its people, its history, how it perceives its history, its language, its literature, its culture. Uh, uh, before we contemplate a major intervention. Um, uh, we need also to understand that with all the knowledge and planning we may be able to muster, if it's a military intervention, uh, we are not going to be able to predict the consequences. Because we're not talking about in just third and fourth order consequences, we are talking about 30th and 40th order consequences. There is no human being alive who could say, well, Iraq in 2012 has turned out precisely as I predicted in uh, March 2003. Uh, no way to do it. Um, uh, we found out about unintended consequences, of course, in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, when the Israelis invaded in 1982 with our tacit support. Um, uh, seemed like a good idea to take down the PLO. Uh, what we got in its place, we could not possibly have foreseen that was his bullet, uh, which remains a very lethal actor in Lebanon and beyond. Uh, the architect, again, of both the uh, embassy and the marine bombings. Uh, so be careful what you get into uh, uh, and understand and calculate that the uh, the gains are worth the risks, including the risks you can't even imagine, because they're there. Um, uh, the second lesson I learned is the obverse. Um, be equally careful over what you propose to get out of. Uh, withdrawal can have consequences even more profound than interventions. Um, when we withdrew the Marines from Lebanon in early 1984, Syria and its ally, Iran, uh, uh, took the lesson that Americans have a low pain threshold um, and even less patience. Um, so all you got to do is make them bleed and outlast them. Uh, 
they employed exactly the same strategy against us in Iraq um, uh, in 06, 07. Uh, when I arrived uh, in early 07 as ambassador, the Iraq I found reminded me very disturbingly of the Lebanon I had left a quarter of a century before. Uh, uh, with Iranian-backed militias uh, resembling uh, Hezbollah, in fact, trained by Hezbollah in some cases, uh, occupying large swaths of the south uh, and the center, uh, Sunni insurgents backed by Syria, uh, including al-Qaeda, uh, active uh, in the west. Uh, uh, so again, it was the same duo from hell, Syria and Iran, using proxies as they did in Lebanon uh, to drive us out of Iraq, and it almost worked. Um, uh, Dave Petraeus, my, uh, my great friend and uh, uh, one of the greatest individuals ever to wear the uniform, uh, went in together. Um, one of the hardest things we had to do was not develop and implement a winning strategy. It was to spend most of our lives testifying before Congress uh, in September 2007 uh, as the national sentiment and the sentiment on the Hill was just to pull the plug. Um, uh, and what we tried to do was say, ladies, gentlemen, consider the consequences. Uh, you're tired, we're tired, we live there, uh, you know, we're really tired. Uh, uh, but if we withdraw and leave Iraq to Al Qaeda and Iranian-backed militias. Uh, we are risking American national security in a totally irresponsible fashion in view of what happened in 9-11. Uh, mercifully, um, the plug was not pulled. Iraq has at least a fighting chance uh, uh, for uh, uh, acceptable security and stability. It is never going to be Switzerland with palm trees. Uh, 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 but, you know, we have, I think, at least averted to what could have been a major disaster. We're having the same debate now on Afghanistan. Uh, uh, and there we set up a network of bilateral and international agreements that, if implemented, uh, should ensure the Afghans, again, more than a reasonable chance of long-term stability. It requires our engagement. Uh, um, and it uh, requires a certain amount of support. The, the Chicago NATO summit uh, produced pledges to support uh, uh, into the out years uh, an Afghan force of about 230,000. Um, it will cost us about 2.5 billion, um, roughly half the, uh, the total expense that sounds like a lot of money until you consider that we're spending roughly $110 million a year currently in Afghanistan. Uh, what the Afghans have shown uh, in recent history is that um, they don't need to be the best army in the world or the fifth best. They just need to be better than the enemies they're fighting. Uh, and after the Soviet withdrawal, um, the Afghan army uh, was more than a match for the Mujahideen militia groups uh, hung together with no Soviet advisors or support except financial. Uh, the Afghan army did not crumble until the money stopped in 1992. Uh, and uh, based on what we've seen of their, their resolve, their determination, and their increasing capabilities, I think it is not at all unreasonable to expect beyond 2014 that uh, an internationally supported Afghan security force uh, is going to be more than a match for whatever is left of the, um, of the Taliban and their friends. Um, happy to talk more about Afghanistan and its next door neighbor, uh, uh, Pakistan, which is, again, perhaps the largest challenge we're going to face in the region. Um, 
with uh, a population of 180 million people and nuclear weapons with uh, an increasingly active Islamic insurgency inside its own borders. Uh, more Pakistani soldiers have died on the Afghan-Pakistan frontier uh, at the hands of these insurgents than the combination of Afghan civilians, Afghan security forces, and coalition security forces all combined in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, so the long-term stability of Pakistan and how we relate to it, I think, is a, a critical U.S. Uh, security imperative. And um, I wish our leaders wisdom and courage in dealing with it. Um, let me say just a, a few words about um, what is going on in the Arab world broadly, the so-called uh, Arab Spring. Um, yeah, that started uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, of course, in late 2010, spread to Egypt, um, major demonstrations in Tahrir Square. Um, you know, the TV camera lights went off uh, about the end of January. Uh, democracy had prevailed, uh, peace had come. Uh, those of us who knew the region said, uh, yeah, well, maybe not quite yet. Um, and we are, of course, seeing the sad truth of that uh, uh, in Libya, in Egypt itself, uh, where President Morsi is uh, under significant challenge, and, of course, in Syria. Uh, uh, it is the largest upheaval uh, and the greatest turmoil the Middle East has seen since the revolution of the 1950s that brought down the monarchies in uh, Iraq, uh, in Egypt, uh, a bit later in Libya. Um, this time, the monarchies are doing pretty well. Thank you very much. Um, Bahrain faced problems early on. Uh, uh, overcame those in a not entirely pleasant way. Uh, Bahrain being a small state with a Shia Islamic majority ruled by a Sunni Islam minority. Um, uh, but the monarchies have, uh, have withstood this very well. It's the so-called republics um, that uh, uh, are facing the challenges or have had their governments uh, overthrown. And it's, again, a caution there to us. Uh, many Americans were writing off the monarchies as um, consigned to the dustbin of history decades ago. They've proven remarkably resilient, uh, you know, from Morocco to Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, <laughs> Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Oman. Uh, and the republics have shown themselves to be highly vulnerable. Uh, there are more ways of keeping in touch with one's people than holding rigged elections. Um, uh, and the Saudis are masters at this. Uh, uh, let, me, let me finish by talking about Syria, um, uh, because that potentially presents the greatest immediate challenge for us and indeed uh, for our Western allies. Um, uh, I, I would make a couple of points. Um, uh, first, don't count the Assad regime out. Um, uh, it may go down, um, uh, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, uh, one Syrian friend told me that the Assad regime, father and son, has spent 40 years preparing for this moment. Um, uh, a highly cohesive, uh, highly disciplined, very well armed, and absolutely ruthless regime um, against um, a national coalition of uh, Syrian revolutionary and opposition groups that is neither national nor a coalition, um, uh, which we have recognized. Um, 
I think we remain uncertain as to what we now do, having recognized them. Um, uh, my advice to the administration comes back to my earlier point about diplomacy being an inherently risky but very important business. Uh, if we've recognized them as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people, well, we need American diplomats in there with them. Um, that's what you do with government you recognize. Um, uh, yes, it would be a very risky proposition, but I can tell you uh, if tomorrow the President and the Secretary of State were to ask for volunteers, uh, most hands in the Foreign Service would go up for that duty. Uh, it's what we do. Uh, but that decision has not been taken, so we're kind of flying blind. Uh, we're not exactly sure what we've recognized, uh, what their agendas are, uh, what their long-term intentions are, who backs them. Um, and as we've seen in Libya, uh, you know, that can have some pretty lethal results um, uh, for, for all concerned. So, you know, first order of business goes back to you know, my first principle of the Middle East, uh, uh, be careful what you get into and know what you're getting into. Um, that doesn't mean do nothing, quite the contrary. It means intelligent engagement, identification of friend and foe uh, that can then lead to sensible policy decisions. And uh, we, unfortunately, are simply not there uh, in terms of grounds for policy decisions because we're not there on the ground in Syria. Um, uh, should the Assad's fall, um, uh, I think you're going to see uh, a far bloodier mess than um, we're already looking at. Uh, it will be open season on Alawis, the uh, a minority Shia schism uh, that rules the country and uh, of which the Assads are members. Uh, but as we saw in Afghanistan, once the Soviets were out, the Afghan factions united against them, then turned on each other in a horrific civil war that eventually led to the Taliban. Um, uh, and I think there's every chance you would see that in Syria. Uh, uh, these groups do not share the same vision, the same agenda, uh, and I think uh, there is every likelihood of a struggle for power in a post-Assad era. Who would triumph um, in that struggle? Um, uh, again, very hard to say, but normally the winners are the best organized, the most determined, and the best armed. Unfortunately, that um, uh, means in Syria the most militant of the Islamists. Uh, the remnants of the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood and their Al-Qaeda allies. Uh, uh, the Iraqis are kind of the uh, canary in the mineshaft on this. As a uh, Shia-governed polity, um, they are scared to death of what could happen to them uh, if Sunni Islamists take over in Syria. Uh, uh, so be careful, you, you may get what you wish for, uh, the fall of the Assad's. Uh, uh, I can't guarantee very much, and I have made a career out of not making long-term predictions, uh, but uh, one thing I would confidently predict, you, you will not see a stable and secure Syria in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Assad regime. Uh, and you could see consequences in Iraq, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Israel, from, uh, from Hezbollah, and in Turkey. Uh, all of those countries are deeply worried about what comes next. All are urging that we be more engaged than we are. Unfortunately, they're all urging different types of engagement, um, which takes me once again to my point. There is no substitute for um, uh, not American boots on the ground, but American wingtips and high heels on the ground uh, uh, to sort out and report back um, uh, uh, what is going on. Uh, so with that, uh, let me just make one more pitch. Um, 
I, I talked in general about encouraging uh, 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 children who are thinking about what to do to consider the foreign service. I particularly encourage young women to, to think about a career in the foreign service. Um, uh, we're approaching 50% female uh, in the service. We are increasingly looking like America. Um, and unlike the military services, uh, there is no assignment uh, and no place, no matter how dangerous, uh, that we will not send a woman to. Um, uh, a large percentage of my staff in both Iraq and Afghanistan, including those downrange, uh, uh, were females. Um, uh, so, um, you know, if, uh, if we're not yet at the point where you can command a tank as a woman, well, you can do any job in the foreign service a man can do and run the same risk of getting your head blown off as a man can. I'm sure that'll be a big selling point when you go home. <laughs> With that, I'd uh, be happy to take any other comments or questions. September, um, so named by the Palestinians who wound up losing, uh, but they made a very serious attempt to take over the entire country. Um, and in this, they are um, of the same mind, it's kind of interesting how it works, uh, Yasser Arafat and Ariel Sharon would be in complete agreement uh, uh, that there is a state of Palestine and it's Jordan. Um, uh, you're seeing some of these same tensions emerge. Um, part of it, uh, reverberations of the Arab Spring. Uh, part of it, uh, uh, economic hardship. Uh, Jordan is a poor country that uh, has a very small resource base. Part of it, uh, again, instigated by um, radical Islamic elements, uh, both inside and outside the country. Uh, uh, is the monarchy in peril in Jordan? Uh, not, in my view, at this stage. Uh, should the Assad regime collapse and a radical Sunni uh, uh, group ascend, then they would be in trouble. Uh, again, history on which we're a great people, but what we're not is patient, and we are relentlessly monolingual and ahistorical. Um, um, there's a, a great book written a long time ago um, by a Lebanese-American named Philip Hitti called The History of the Arab Peoples, uh, 1939, I think, is when the first edition came out. He, he talks in there about Syria. Syria in 1939 uh, was 
Jordan, the Palestinian territories, Israel, Lebanon, and modern-day Syria. Uh, there are a lot of Syrians uh, who would like to bring back uh, the historical Syria. Um, uh, you know, with uh, an eye initially to Jordan and to Lebanon. Um, and uh, again, the Assads were prudent enough uh, not to do really rash things. I'm not sure what a successor regime would do. Uh, interesting footnote, uh, Black September failed. Uh, the Palestinian bid to take over uh, Jordan failed in large part uh, because after the Syrian government ordered uh, an armored column uh, into Jordan in support of the Palestinians, the commander of the Air Force, uh, one Hafez al-Assad, declined to give them or the Palestinians air support. Um, uh, a few months later, he took over the country. So. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask you, uh, since you didn't mention Egypt, and you question the takeover of Syria by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they are a very conservative Sunni sect, uh, such as Morsi, uh, or, or a political party. And Morsi went to the University of Southern California, which is a, a very reputable Middle East studies program. And but Saudi Arabia and all of these monarchies in the Gulf being Sunni, uh, and such strong allies to the point that we allied with Kuwait to push Iraq out. I wonder um, why there is this disposition currently in Washington to be prejudiced against a Muslim Brotherhood government, a conservative Sunni government in Syria. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to think that policy in Washington had evolved to the point of having a position on a conservative Muslim government in Syria. Uh, about as far as we've gone is saying that uh, Assad should go and that we recognize the national coalition, whatever it is. Uh, 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 I would be concerned about not a conservative Muslim government arising in Syria, but a deeply radicalized militant Islamic movement taking control. The Syrian Muslim Brotherhood is not like the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and we've already got, and the Egyptians have a problem with uh, some of President Morsi's policies, both on Islamization and uh, autocratic rule. The Syrian Muslim Brotherhood is highly radicalized because, again, of the event that occurred that most Americans never knew about at the time, and certainly have forgotten if they did, February 1982, uh, faced with a Muslim Brother insurgency in Syria, uh, uh, centered on Syria's fourth largest city of Hama. Uh, uh, Assad ordered the city ringed by armor and artillery and reduced it to rubble, killing between 10 and 20,000 people all Sunnis, almost all Sunnis. Uh, he killed a hundred or two Muslim brothers in the process and eliminated that threat. Uh, but the Sunnis generally and the remnants of the Brotherhood have never forgotten it. Uh, 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 you know, uh, they make the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood look like the PTA. Um, so that, that's what would worry me, and I think that's what would worry Washington once they get around to thinking about it. <laughs> what should we do about Pakistan? Uh, it, it, it's a great question. Uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill is widely quoted as saying, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Uh, uh, we have tried pressuring Pakistan, we have tried walking away from Pakistan, uh, which we did after the uh, Soviet uh, defeat in Afghanistan. In the space of a single year, they went, as they put it, from being the most allied of allies to being the most sanctioned of adversaries. Uh, uh, when we withdrew all economic and military assistance, uh, 
because of uh, their nuclear weapons program that they had announced uh, uh, 15 years before, but never mind, we needed them in Afghanistan, so we were prepared to forget it until we didn't need them anymore, and then uh, we stopped seeking waivers to the, uh, the Presser Amendment and the sanctions went into play. Uh, this has created a psychosis almost in Pakistan that, uh, well, okay, you Americans are back, when are you leaving again, and what mess are you going to leave us with? Uh, uh, it's one of the reasons that they hedged their bets uh, through some support for the Taliban. Uh, uh, they do not want to see a situation in which the U.S. withdrawals, withdraws the Taliban takes over Afghanistan again, but this time it's the Taliban that they uh, took on with force of arms and will be a bitter, determined, and very dangerous adversary. So my view is, uh, in spite of uh, all the problems we have with Pakistan, uh, that we do everything we can to cement a long-term strategic relationship that will change over time their strategic calculus as to what is and isn't in their interest. I think they've already figured out that support for Islamic radicalism is uh, getting a lot of Pakistanis killed. They're not sure they've got another alternative. We could be that alternative, but it will take a courageous political decision uh, to do so. Um, uh, I, during my years there, 04 to 07, I, I, I worked hard to try and cement that. Uh, we pushed through the F-16 sale, which had uh, enormous symbolic significance uh, since we withheld the delivery of F-16s when we, we sanctioned them. Um, uh, that went a long way at the time, but it, it has to be a sustained policy. Uh, and I think that is the only thing um, that is going to work. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, the danger of, again, a country of 180 million people uh, with a lot of nuclear weapons uh, that could be governed by some people who are really, really dangerous. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit negative here. I would like to make a statement, and I'd like your comment on it, please. Uh, when the Taliban ran Afghanistan, the poppy fields were closed, and the flow of drugs stopped. We go in there, and the poppy fields are open again, which makes me wonder who the good guys or the bad guys are there. The first thing that is important is to understand why the Taliban banned poppy cultivation in the last year of their regime. They did it to drive up prices, and they did drive them up. Uh, they, by almost tenfold. Uh, uh, they did it not to take drugs off the street. Uh, they did it to make more of a profit on the drugs they already had. Um, and, uh, you know, I think had they persisted in power, you know, once uh, again, it's market forces, uh, whether uh, you're dealing with illicit or illicit profits, uh, uh, they would have uh, gone back to cultivation uh, at, a, uh, at a level that sustained the prices they wanted. Uh, yeah. um, uh, because of demand, largely in the West, um, prices are pretty darn good. Um, but you are right to be critical. Um, uh, after 10 years, uh, None of us have found a good way uh, to dramatically reduce uh, poppy cultivation. Uh, you know, we've tried forced eradication. Um, uh, the only thing that historically has worked, it worked in Pakistan, is alternative crops that will give a farmer at least as much income as he will get uh, from growing poppies combined with uh, penalties for growing poppies. So incentive plus penalty. Uh, we haven't got the incentive thing down yet, uh, but uh, it's the only thing that is going to work. And, and uh, we've taken too long, I think, to uh, 
uh, make a sustained effort on this. Again, you know, Afghanistan is hard. Uh, uh, anyone who served there knows that. Uh, and you, you go for the wolf that's closest to the sled. Um, and uh, for us, that has been, you know, the, the armed insurgency with uh, narcotics taking a second place, even though it, it uh, helps fuel the insurgency. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Eliza Berger from Perdon High School. And I was wondering, if the Constitution was passed in Egypt um, this Saturday, what do you think would happen to the role of women in Egyptian society? Yeah, I, I don't know um, uh, what the, uh, the form of the current text is, um, but it's one of the things we're concerned about uh, with the current government. Um, uh, they have, uh, put it mildly, not shown an inclination uh, uh, to give equal opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to women. Uh, earlier drafts, made no mention of uh, the protection uh, of the rights of all citizens, including women, equal opportunity for all citizens. Uh, what will actually, uh, the current text again, I don't know. I know there was an effort to uh, rewrite parts of that. Um, uh, but uh, among the many things that would concern me in Egypt, uh, uh, is, uh, is the future of women. Um, I am even more concerned about the future of women in Afghanistan should we decide uh, we're done there before the Afghans are ready to uh, uh, really take their future in their own hands. Uh, women have made enormous progress in, um, in Afghanistan. Uh, that constitution mandates that 25% of the parliament will be female. The actual number or percentage is higher because women are winning seats in head-to-head -head competition with male candidates. 40% uh, uh, of uh, 8 million students in Afghanistan are female. Uh, if the Taliban comes back, that will drop to zero, just as it was when I arrived in 2002. Uh, so, uh, again, militant Islam, or political Islam um, uh, can cut two ways. Uh, there are Islamic governments uh, like that, the current government in Afghanistan. Uh, it is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Uh, Islam is written into the Constitution, but so are equal rights for women. Uh, the two are not incompatible. Um, and, you know, those who say, particularly Muslims who say they are, you know, need to reflect that um, the Prophet's uh, favored wife, Khadija, basically he married for her money um, because she was a very successful businesswoman running caravans all over the Arabian Peninsula. And that was just fine with the Prophet. Uh, <laughs> Time for, uh, for one last question here. In our World Affairs Council uh, talk, Bernard Lewis characterized the Middle East as a place where, where often uh, governments that are friendly to the U.S. Uh, are combined with a general populace that uh, hates our culture and hates everything we're all about. And I think he used Egypt and Saudi Arabia as an example of that. And he used uh, Iran as an example of a government that is very unfriendly to us combined with a population that, for the most part, uh, is not unfriendly. Could you comment on that and maybe reference specifically where Pakistan might fall? I, I can speak uh, directly to uh, Egypt and Pakistan, having served uh, three years in each country. Um, I, you know, I never felt uh, a, a strong anti-American tendency among the general population, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, yeah, I never felt threatened. Um, uh, loved to go down to uh, Cairo's Grand Bazaar, uh, just have a cup of tea with shopkeepers, and if they found out you were American, have another cup of tea, it's on my house. Uh, uh, 
it, it tended to be, uh, uh, if you can say there was anti-Americanism, it would be along the lines of, we love you, we don't like your policies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli Arab dispute. Uh, but I never saw that personalized. Never saw it in Pakistan either. Uh, we were, uh, I was talking to my friends from Boeing earlier who make the magnificent Chinook among uh, uh, many other uh, great products. Um, uh, the Chinook was deployed in Pakistan in support of uh, earthquake relief efforts in, 19, uh, in 2005 when 80,000 Pakistani died in two minutes. Uh, it was the largest and longest humanitarian relief effort airborne since the Berlin Airlift. Uh, and the Chinooks carried almost all the freight. Uh, this was up into the, uh, uh, the northwest and northeast of Pakistan, considered a, uh, a home for anti-American militants. Um, we did not have, during the six months of that mission, a single incident of hostile action against an American service member or civilian or against one of our helicopters. Indeed, we got great big American flag decals and put them on the fuselage of the uh, Chinooks. Uh, the first ones in came from Afghanistan where they were in a war. And when we proposed this to the air crews, they said, well, great, why don't we just shoot them down ourselves and you know, <laughs> save everybody the bother? And we said, look, we know what we're doing. And uh, that American flag, American flag Chinook became the symbol of all that's good in this country uh, and was highly, highly popular with the people, um, uh, not, not with the government. So uh, you know, there certainly are militants uh, who want to kill and do kill Americans, uh, but that is not reflective of um, either the Egyptian population or the Pakistani population, um, in, certainly in my experience. Thank you all. I'm sorry we didn't get to every uh, every question. Um, before you uh, leave the stage, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to invite uh, Patrick Donnelly uh, from Boeing uh, to make a special gift presentation. So, Ambassador Crocker, on behalf of Boeing and the Bukhari Foundation and the World Affairs Council, we'd like to thank you today for sharing our, our views. Now. And just for that, we're going to give you a document called Birch's Views of Philadelphia. Oh my now, William Birch was a, uh, an artist who captured uh, images of colonial Philadelphia. And this was actually compiled by Robert Tiedelman, who was the director of the World Affairs Council. My goodness. So, on behalf of us, uh, I'd like to thank you not only for what you said today, but your service to the country. Thank you very much. <laughs> the opportunity to do so uh, as well. Uh, before we adjourn, I'd like to ask everyone please stay seated briefly uh, for the Council's annual meeting. Uh, and I'd like to invite John Walsh, the Chairman of the World First Council of Philadelphia, to the podium to preside uh, over that meeting. Thanks, Greg. Uh, little did you know when you signed up to hear the insights of Ambassador Crocker that you were going to be part of an annual meeting. But uh, seeing we have you all here today, uh, we wanted to take a few minutes to take you through and update you on uh, what's been going on in the council. And, and I really have a, a plum assignment today in that having done none of the work myself, I get to uh, bring you up to speed on the tremendous work that uh, Claudia and now Craig and their teams have been doing over the last year. Um, <clears throat> when we think about uh, the council, uh, we think about uh, a vision of, of building global citizens, and today is a great example of a program that, that does just that in terms of enhancing our knowledge of critical and complex issues. And when we think about that, we have three platforms, uh, teach, talk, travel, and I'll talk briefly about each. Uh, First, on the teach side, uh, the education program, 